Thank you. Yes, and I just want to acknowledge my um, co-authors in this particular chapter, um, Philip, Amal, and uh, Eliana also contributed. So just to note that. Um, yes, I'll talk about the role of ethics guidelines, and I'll just um, centre this on this, this question that also we've been discussing, which is how we incorporate ethics and human rights consideration, considerations in the governance of emerging technologies. And so in the context of that question, the answer that we can give in this session is to do with, well, uh, practical instruments such as ethics codes and ethics guidelines. Um, what we're um, particularly interested in is ways to uh, guide and govern ethical behavior. Um, and these offer slightly different approaches. For instance, the ethics codes tend to offer guidelines for ethical behavior by individual professionals in various fields. And as you can see, I've put some examples here. This includes, for example, uh, where you have a code of ethics that outline aspirational values and principles, or where you have a code of conduct that's more practical and outlines accepted behaviors, um, You know what you can do, what you ought not to do, that's more prescriptive. And I've noticed actually the idea that a code of ethics is sometimes considered vague, um, and that's partly to do with that aspirational uh, element, whereas a code of conduct is considered a little bit more um, proactive and uh, applied. Uh, and then, of course, you do have a, a mixed methods approach, such as the code of ethics and professional conduct, which might try to integrate uh, integrity based and compliant based uh, codes. Um, but what we find in Siena is that for the kinds of technologies, uh, particularly emerging technologies, what we're particularly uh, interested in are the ways that uh, ethics guidelines rather than codes offer uh, an approach to setting standards for practices, uh, especially with multiple actors. So it allows for something a little bit broader uh, with scope for further specificity later down the line. So when we think about ethics guidelines, what we're talking about then are uh, guidelines for general practices for either a single technology or a set of technologies. It might uh, include multiple actors and contexts, and it may uh, define desirable outcomes. Um, there's also the scope, as I say, to, to narrow that approach later down the line for more practice specific ethics guidelines, um, for instance, for research contexts. Um, but yes, that would be that would be a sort of next step or an alternative approach. So what I'm going to talk about today are these ethics guidelines, not the codes. I'll give you a little bit of background into what we've done in Siena um, and describe some of the cases that we looked at. Then I'll outline our proposal for an 11 step, step approach. And finally, I'll um, outline um, some approaches to oper operationalization, as well as indicating some of the difficulties with that. OK, so for the background, we looked at a number of uh, different cases. The first thing to bear in mind is that, in fact, uh, in the literature, very little is written about how to develop ethics guidelines. Typically, uh, the literature covers how to develop codes, even if those codes are codes of ethics. So we looked at uh, a broad range of, range of literature in, in that uh, field. And we looked also at some particular case studies, including the Canadian Psychological Association uh, Code of Ethics and what they went through, their different steps. We also looked at the um, ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI. Um, and then, of course, there is also the Siena approach. So I'm working in human enhancement, as Philip uh, noted. And in that strand of Siena, we have developed ethics guide guidelines for human enhancement. Um, so what we did from is to extrapolate from these particular cases um, a number of steps, a number of um, difficulties, uh, as well as sort of practical advice for undertaking this very important work. Uh, including, you know, ways in which to engage with stakeholders, ways in which to categorize, um, to ground work in ethical values and principles, engaging with experts, uh, including independent experts, and also those important literature reviews that I mentioned. Um, for the Siena approach in human enhancement, these are the five steps that we took 
So we began by mapping relevant fields. We also, um, that included the literature reviews, which was quite broad, it covered a number of different areas. Um, we also um, focused on what values uh, the guidelines or, or any guidance, in fact, might need to have at their heart. And then, of course, came stakeholder engagement, thinking about who we talked with, about what and when, trying to ensure a broad range of views, um, which takes into account consultation and how to balance judgments and disagreement. The third step concerned gathering the consensus, which needs to be discursive, flexible, responsive, um, assessing people's positions. So not only their um, perspectives, but their, the, the context within which those perspectives are offered. And of course, the process of drafting, drafting and redrafting um, in response to all of that um, information. And then the next step we had was a public consultation, you know, that required that we thought quite carefully about who we would consult and how and um, not to restrict which public uh, pe people responded, but rather to ensure that we were reaching a broad range by thinking about how people would learn about the information, as well as how to frame understanding and knowledge and ways in which to distinguish between individuals and groups. And finally, the stage that we've been at in, in recent uh, months is the buy-in stage, looking to implement these um, proposal, pro proposals and guidelines uh, as practical strategies and solutions, um, un uh, utilizing networks and uh, raising awareness. Okay, so that's um, what we did. Our proposal therefore from that, is for an 11 step approach to the development of guidelines. So if other people want to do the same kind of thing, here's what we suggest. Um, so I'll give you the sort of broad overview and then I'll go into a little bit more detail. Our first three steps we estimate take between a year or two years. And it's partly because of how much work is, is needed, for instance, uh, in establishing, establishing the rationale, establishing support, making a development plan. And as I say, I'll go into these in a bit more detail in a moment. But this is just to give you a, a sort of snapshot and overview of what this looks like. Uh, the next stage, you can sort of break into three parts, the, the securing of resources, collecting information and establishing those basic principles. And then you have the sort of drafting consultation uh, process, which then ties into that establishing of, of um, a mechanism for ownership and vision. And finally, the dissemination, implementation and enforcement stages. So that's the snapshot in more detail. That first step requires that you establish the, the guidelines are needed. And that can be quite a tricky process because you need to consult with lots of different um, people. Um, that leads neatly onto the second step which includes garnering support as well as commitment from stakeholders. And this may send you back to the first step where you start to question again, are the guidelines needed? Do the stakeholders think that they're needed? And if so, will they or won't they commit? And the implications of that. This then leads to the third step of um, making this development plan, defining objectives, constraints, requirements, resources, structures, procedures, timetables, and so on. Next is the step for securing resources, as well as doing your base organization, such as you know, financial resources, how you're going to, to undertake uh, the work that's required um, and engaging with stakeholders and sort of gathering expertise. After this is the uh, further information collection, but this is to do with those you know, existing guidelines, principles, um, cases in law, um, as well as methods and procedures that may be context specific for the guidelines being developed. After this, you come back again to, to the best part, the drafting, drafting, discussion, drafting, drafting, and, and further redrafting, always more drafting than you might expect, uh, with uh, an aim to establish consensus, but with the recognition that consensus may be possible only for certain limited parts, which then allow you to build other proposals. So I'm happy to talk about that some more in the, in the questions if you'd like. Next comes that public, public consultation stage I've already described, as well as that mechanism for ownership and revision, um, trying to make sure that there aren't copyright restrictions so that these can be broadly shared, as well as a process for revision and resources to ensure that that can take place. 
then there's dissemination and implementation, which includes, you know, informing people about the guidelines, how to use them, uh, offering training, as well as plans for oper operationalization, which I'll come to. Um, and you might want to consider at this stage uh, any actor-specific guidelines, such as assessment lists uh, and other instruments. And finally, enforcement, whether this is going to remain as soft law, you know, commitment that people feel or by enforcement, or whether this is something that could become future law or policy. And then finally, we have this stage of operationalization, which is where you seek to make the guidelines concrete, specific, measurable, um, targeted and action guiding. And the aim here is to ensure that there is a practical outcome, a practical effect of these guidelines. And again, I just want to offer you a snapshot of this um, process, which some of which uh, it fits also with that 11 step approach. Um, but at this point, what you're looking to do is to target for specific contexts so as to make these guidelines as practical as possible. So again, you have this sense in which you need to really define what it is that you are um, doing. So moving from the sort of general values and normative concepts um, to then, as you see in that second step, specific components and subdivisions. Then in that third step, you have a specification of means. So what it, would it take for the guidelines to be satisfied through what means and through what steps? Then you need to consider also the action actor and practice introduction. So this could include attaching actions to guidelines. So as to ensure that there is an expectation for who is going to do what, and that still can be in very general terms. Whereas at the next stage, you might be thinking, and this doesn't have to be in a sort of linear temporal um, context. These things can happen simultaneously. You can come back to one from another and so on. Um, but as another step, step five, you might be targeting more specific actors and actions, whether they're um, particular uh, developers, for example. Uh, and then finally, you might also be thinking about this in terms of specific cases um, and offering guidance to actors who might want to use these guidelines, but might need um, to know a little bit more about how to, um, how to use them and in what practical ways they can apply them.